brothers and sisters and all those who might be viewing this today. Uh, we uh, want to say hello from the Hohenwall Church of Christ and uh, we are glad you're joining us uh, virtually uh, for to share in our worship service. I do have a few announcements uh, as we begin. I uh, want to uh, extend our sympathy to Margie Wee Adams and her family uh, following the passing of her husband Ron. Uh, Margie and her husband, you may know, moved to Florida uh, earlier this year and Ron passed away from complications of uh, an infection this past week. Our, our hearts go out to them. We have some good news. Uh, con congratulations uh, to Kelsey and Christian Perry on the birth of their daughter, Ellis Kate, on October 17th of 2020, weighing in at 6 pounds, 12.9 ounces, and she was 19 and a half inches long. A uh, couple other things. Uh, this week, there are four birthdays uh, in our congregation. Garrett Reeves on the 10th, Bill Lynch on November 11th, Jeff Holbrook and Reagan Clayton on November 13th. So we celebrate those days uh, with those families. Also, the uh, church here at the Hohenwald uh, Church will be hosting a blood drive uh, for the American Red Cross and our Family Life Center on Friday, November 20, from 1.30 to 5.30. You will have to go to the redcross.org slash give to schedule an appointment uh, or download the Red Cross app to schedule your appointment. I have a uh, scripture we begin with uh, today from Habakkuk 2 verse 14. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Would you bow with me as we go to God in prayer? Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the way that you bless our lives every day. And Father, we pray that you will help us to pause and daily and remember how great you are and what you've done for us. Father, we thank you for the people in this world who are world leaders. Father, we thank you for your putting them in place. Fathers, we have just endured a, a long election cycle. It appears that a, a candidate has become victorious. And Father, our role as Christians and as Americans is to pray for this, these leaders. And we pray, Father, that they will do a good job in leading our country forward. We pray, Father, that you bless their health help them in the decisions they make. And we pray, Father, also that uh, this world might begin to see the value in your word and how great your plan is, Father. Father, we ask your blessings to be upon those who have lost loved ones, as some we've mentioned, for those so many who are sick, not only in this community, Father, but worldwide. And though we have no cure right now for COVID-19, we have a cure for a much greater illness, the illness of sin. And Father, your son shedding his blood is the cure for our sins if we'll only live faithfully for him. And Father, now we ask that you be with us as we spend time in your word and, and taking communion and sharing with you. We ask you to be with Greg as he delivers our message today, Father, that it might be uh, uplifting to us and challenging that we might grow closer to you. We ask these things in the name of your Son, Jesus. And amen. As we gather around the table this morning, Jesus Christ shed His blood to cut a new covenant with His creation, to forever bridge the divide of sin that had put a chasm between man and God. He initiated a new covenant 
that was prophesied by Jeremiah. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it. And I will be their God, and they will be my people. Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 33. This new covenant at once ended, excuse me, this new covenant at once echoed and fulfilled the promises made to Abram. Instead of coming to earth as smoke and fire, God sent His Son to come to earth in human flesh to walk with us. Instead of a sacrificial animal torn into two to signify the covenant, God offered His own Son, the spotless Lamb, whose body would be broken as the greatest sacrifice. I invite you to pray with me. Our Father God, we thank you for this that represents the body of our Savior, Christ Jesus. Father, we thank you for the sacrifice that he was willing to endure on our behalf. And Father, we ask your blessing on this bread that represents that body. May we take it in a way that's pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And I invite you to pray with me once again. Holy Father, in the same manner we come before you now asking your blessing on this cup and on the fruit of the vine within it that represents the shed blood of Jesus Christ. We praise you for the sacrifice. But Father, we equally praise you for the resurrection. Father, we often seem to forget that we worship a living God. We talk so much at this time, at this table, about the death of Jesus. But Father, help us to always remember that what separates our religion from any other religion that people can come up with, from any other deity that can be falsely worshipped, is that we celebrate a living God, that our Savior rose from the grave. And we thank you for that. It is in his name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, church. I invite you to turn in your Bibles or on your Bible apps. We're going to look at two uh, scriptures this morning. The first is Jonah chapter 1. Jonah chapter 1 and the other is in Romans 14. And I have to admit, I've been kind of amazed that I've spent this much time in one chapter of Scripture. But as I said at the outset of our series from the book of Jonah, that, uh, that there is more going on here than we might initially think. There's more going on here than what we might have understood when we first learned this story. We know about the fish and... Uh, you know, we know about the vine maybe at the end of the, of the story, but there's so much going on in between that, that I think so many of us, I know I, have never really truly considered. And so Jonah 1 and Romans 14 are the two places uh, that we are going to be uh, this morning. And forgive me for fiddling so much with my shirt sleeves, but... Uh, I always leave them down when I put a shirt on, and then they, before too long, I got to roll them up. So here we are. Um, before uh, 
Before I begin, I do want to uh, go to God in prayer, so I invite you to join me. Our Father God, as we gather this morning, and Father, you know, once again, we're online, and we may be for a few more weeks, it may be several more weeks, and God, I just pray that you will be with us. I pray that you will be with the body of believers that make up uh, the church family that is the Holy Wall Church of Christ. And Father, I pray that you give us patience in affliction. And I pray that you uh, help us all to do whatever we can uh, to minimize the effects of the virus, to minimize the spread, maybe I should say. And Father, I pray now that as we open Holy Scripture, that I will do justice uh, to what, uh, what is written in this beautiful book. Father, I pray that you will uh, be with this message, that it will, as always, be yours and yours alone. I pray that you be with me as the messenger, because I am not worthy to do this uh, without the guidance of you. And Father, I pray that you be with the audience that receives it, that as wherever they might be at this moment when they, when they listen to this word, that they uh, can have their hearts and minds uh, cleared for the next little while. And Father, we just, uh, we a I ask this prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, there is a section on the back of your bulletins. Uh, and so, uh, because so few of you were able to come by and get a, a hard copy of the bulletin, that's understandable. But uh, those are uploaded online. And so you can go to our website and uh, you can print that off. If you uh, have been here uh, when you were able to fill in the blanks uh, that go along with uh, the, the Sunday morning message, then uh, you can hit pause right now and go print off a hard copy of the bulletin and you can fill that in if that uh, happens to be a blessing to you. Uh, if it is a blessing, I would love to hear some feedback on that. But where we are in Jonah, uh, we, have, we have heard the command from God to Jonah, and uh, we know about the flight to Tarshish when Jonah got on the boat, and then last week, more specifically, we talked about the storm. And so uh, the title of this morning's message is Our True Identity. Now, in a moment I'm going to read from Jonah chapter 1 verses 7 through 10, but I remember my own time of escape. Uh, I was probably in about the first or second grade, and my father was stationed at the Kaneohe Marine Corps Air Station in, uh, near, near Kailua, Hawaii. And uh, I had been sent to my room, uh, I believe, if, if memory serves, I had been sent to my room to clean my room. Uh, my brother Jeff and I shared a room because base housing, uh, which we you know, were assigned to, we, we lived on the base. It was too expensive, especially in Hawaii, to live off the, the military installation. And so uh, base housing usually only had three bedrooms. And so mom and dad got one, my sister got one, Jeff and I, bless his heart, had to we had to share a room together. And so uh, some of you may know what it's like to share a room with your kid brother, but imagine a kid brother that's about seven years younger than you. And so I know I was a thorn in his flesh uh, for some years to say the least. But uh, basically we had to clean up our room and Jeff's, Jeff you know, said, hey, my part of the room is clean, mom. And, uh, you know, she went in to inspect and, and she saw for herself the evidence he presented. And uh, his portion of the room was spick and span. And it was mine that wasn't exactly squared away. And so, uh, and so I was sent into my room to clean it. And uh, behind that closed door, I hatched an escape plan. I decided, you know, I can... You know, it's a one-story house for crying out loud. I can open this window and climb out, and I can go to my friend Jason's house about four doors down the street. 
So what do I do? I open the window, I climb out, and I go down to Jason Carr's house. And so I'm down at the Carr residence, and then at some point, uh, I don't know if it was my brother or my mom who realized that I had uh, flown the coop, so to speak, and so, uh, and so uh, my brother was sent to come after me, and come after me he did. <laughs> and so, you know, Jonah here, uh, he has fled. And what he is realizing is that there are consequences to the actions. We talked uh, in, in previous weeks about how that there are consequences to our sin. And so Jonah is now realizing that. And so, uh, and just like I realized it when I was a child, and there may have been times in your life, uh, whether it was sin or whether it was just something uh, that you did in, in some form of rebellion, whether it's rebellion to God or rebellion to mom and dad, but uh, that you figured out that uh, when you didn't do what you were supposed to do, that there were consequences. And yes, I found out uh, when my dad got home that there were certainly consequences of not listening to mom and uh, jumping out of the window. But in Jonah chapter 1, verses 7 through 10, we read, Then the sailors said to each other, because you know the storm has come up and they are absolutely terrified. So the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity, because it was not a typical storm on the Mediterranean. They cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, Tell us, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? Now, boy, they're peppering Jonah with the questions, aren't they? I mean, he's getting the third degree here. He answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. This terrified them, and they asked, What have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. And so, they give Jonah all these questions, and they're wanting to know, you know, tell us, who is responsible for making this trouble for us? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What's your country? From what people are you? Now, he kind of responds to the last part first, and he answers, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Now, we can read this in such a way that it says... Jonah's got his priorities out of order. And if someone asked me, you know, who are you? In other words, what they're really asking here is, what's your identity? It would be typical of us to say, you know, if we're a foreign land, to say, I'm an American. And let's pause and think about that for a moment. What does that say about us? What does that say? I mean, does, does that convey something to someone else about what we value most? I am a citizen of America. But are we really? Yes, okay. You know, our driver's license says we're a, a citizen of Tennessee or whatever straight state you might be from if you're watching this from out of state. But, but uh, you know... I've got a passport that says I'm a citizen of the United States of America. But where is our true citizenship, church family? Isn't our true citizenship in heaven? When asked about ourselves, shouldn't the first thing we respond with is, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ? Or, uh, I'm a child of God? Now, when Jonah tells them, I am a Hebrew, he is giving them his country. He is giving them the nationality of the people that he is from. And he then says, I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. 
And this is one of those places in uh, the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament uh, where what's translated God is actually Yahweh. And so he gives the name Yahweh, which is the God who saves or is saving God. And so uh, the people are terrified. And of course, Jonah does put it out there that, you know, my God made the dry land and the sea. My God, you know, made it all. And so then they're terrified because of this. And so at that point, uh, they, they ask, what have you done? Because they've figured out that you know, we don't see storms like this. We're professional sailors, and storms like this don't blow up. You know, some of them, I'm sure, their entire career had not seen a storm the likes of which they were enduring at this moment. And so they have, you know, they're using their own ability to reason to say, this is not natural. These are not natural forces at work here. You know, these are supernatural forces. These are divine, excuse me, divine forces that are at work. And so the sailors conclude, conclude that the storm was a punishment for sin. And they cast lots to discover whose wrongdoing it might be. In Jonah's day, who you were and what you worshipped were two sides of the same coin. It was the most foundational layer to someone's identity. And so our identity is how we define ourselves. Uh, our identity, church family, is very important to us, or it should be, because it's what we project to the people around us. Now, the sailors are not wrong in their analysis. Even today, everyone gets their identity from something. Now, I'm going to stop there for just a moment because what is it that you get your identity from? Because the reality is that we are created in the image of God. We talked about that last week. And if we're created in the image of God, it means that human beings were not made to stand alone. And so uh, if we're not made to stand alone, it means that we get our significance and security from something of value outside of ourselves. So that goes back to the question, what is your identity? Uh, I have uh, known people who seem to wrap up their identity in their stuff. Uh, they, you know, they, they wanted nice things, you know, a, a nice big house, uh, in a good neighborhood, uh, nice late model automobiles uh, that were very expensive in a lot of cases. And uh, you just got the sense that that was really what they were about. I've seen people that had nice houses and nice cars, but you, you got the sense from being around them just even a short period of time that that wasn't what they were about. It was just stuff to them. Uh, they had nice stuff because they could afford nice stuff. But then if you knew something about th their life and their story, uh, they were generous people. And they were generous with their time. They were generous with their finances. And uh, they did a lot of things for a lot of different people. And so uh, I've known people that their identity was wrapped up in where they went to college or their favorite sports teams what they wore, uh, what they talked about, what seemed to consume them uh, was the fact that they were an alumnus of a particular school or that they were a fan of a particular team. And what we end up with, you know, with that, and especially if we're children of God, and that's what people see first and foremost when they look on our lives, is that we're wrapped up in stuff or we're wrapped up in where we went to school or we're wrapped up in who we root for, you know, wrapped up in what we wear. What we end up with is projecting a tremendous amount of shallowness to other people. And church family, we do not, as children of God, want to project that kind 
of shallowness. You know, we look in Scripture and uh, in the Gospel accounts, we look at the life of, say, Peter. And Peter uh, is someone who, uh, and someone who at times can be very bold. And I've mentioned Peter so many times when I've, I've preached or taught. He's someone who is so uh, could be so bold. You know, when Jesus says, "Who do you say I am?" and then it's uh, it's Peter that says, "You're the Christ." You know, you're the Son of the Living God. And then Jesus' response in Matthew's Gospel says, you know, he looks at Peter and says, and, you know, on that I build my church. On that rock I build my church. And some people say that it's on Peter, or think that it's on Peter that he's building the church. And no, it's on that confession. The confession that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, is the Son of the living God. Is that what we ask people to say before we baptize them? You know, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? And they say yes. And so, uh, and so Peter was also though someone that we know that he seemed to get scolded more than any of the other members of the twelve. You know, you look at the apostles, and and there were others that had their moments. I mean. Uh, James and John uh, were part of Jesus' most inner circle. Uh, and there's that episode where uh, they're, they're saying, hey, you know, in glory, can one of us sit on the right hand and one of us sit on the left hand? Uh, because those were the seats of honor. And uh, Jesus replies and says, you don't know what you're asking for. Uh, in one of the gospel accounts, it was actually their mother who asked that question. And uh, so nonetheless, there were times when the other apostles uh, had their shortcomings, uh, their short-sightedness, we might say. But, uh, but Peter's the one who seems to really get it wrong. And even, even at the end, uh, when, when Jesus is arrested, and he's told them that he's going to be arrested, he's told them that he has to die, and then what does Peter do? He pulls out the sword and cuts off uh, the ear of the servant of the high priest. And so, you know, right then, and then Jesus has to correct him and say, no, this isn't how we operate. You know, at what point, Jesus is saying, you know, have you ever seen me? And you can kind of read into Jesus' remarks, you know, at what point have you seen me use violence? At what point have, have I operated this way? And so he picks up the ear and puts it back on and he heals the young man. But then it wasn't long after that that Peter denies Jesus three different times. After he was the one when told that, that someone would betray me, Jesus said. It's Peter that says, oh, I won't do it. And then Jesus corrects him and says, actually, yeah, it is you. And before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And he did. And so for, you know, it shows us a shallowness on the part of Peter at this point in his life. That his identity is not wrapped up in really understanding who Jesus was. His identity seemed to be wrapped up in the fact that he was in the inner circle. He liked his status. He liked his newfound position. He was a blue-collar fisherman. You know, he made his living on the Sea of Galilee. And now he's walking around with this guy for a few years who draws these big crowds. And so Peter's, uh, Peter's identity seems to be wrapped up in his status now. Boy, this I didn't, I didn't have crowds coming out to see me fish. But boy, there's crowds now around me. And we know if we read the book of Acts that Peter has taken on a whole different personality now. Peter now understands his identity. Peter is a bold preacher on behalf 
of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But we have to be careful, church family, that we don't uh, get wrapped up in a shallow identity. In Romans chapter 14, uh, it says, beginning with verse 7, For none of us lives for ourselves alone, and none of us dies for ourselves alone. If we live, we live for the Lord, and if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. And so uh, Paul reminding us as he writes those words to the church in Rome and for our benefit as well, that, that, this, is, uh, that this is our identity, uh, that we should be people who, uh, who identify as children of God, that we don't live alone, we don't live for ourselves, that our identity as being made in the image of God means that we draw an identity from outside of us. The thing is, God gave us the free will, church family, of how we choose that identity. And so let's not make the mistake of choosing a worthless and shallow identity. Let's let our identity first and foremost be as children of God. Jonah's response to the sailors can give the impression uh, that his race and nationality were more important than his faith. And we might identify as a white person or as an American more so than as a child of God. And if that's the case, that's a problem. Now is the perfect time. Rick mentioned it in his prayer a little while ago about what our nation is facing right now, that we seem to be a divided people. And so now is the perfect time to strengthen our identity in Christ. Political parties can divide people, but the love of Jesus and sharing the love of Jesus brings people together. Uh, when our identity is outside of Jesus, we exhibit shallow faith. Church family, let's not be people who exhibit shallow faith. If you are not yet a child of God, I, I pray that you won't wait, that you will reach out to us, uh, that you can contact us through our website at hohenwaldchurchofchrist.com, uh, uh, that you will, if you live somewhere far away from here possibly, that, that you will find a minister or a lay leader at a local church where you are. And tell them that I would like to be a child of God. And they will show you how to make that happen. But uh, I do invite you, uh, as we close out our time together this morning, uh, that you uh, will bow with me. Holy Father, I just pray that you will help us to have our identity in you and you alone. That the other stuff will be seen for what it is things that are shallow, things that are of very little value, uh, our hobbies, uh, the, the teams that we root for, uh, that uh, the, the, the places where we might have gone to school, the, the stuff that we have, cars and houses and boats, that we need to be people who I, our identity is with Christ, that we are living for something bigger than ourselves, that we are seen as people who have not a shallow faith, but a deeply rooted faith. That we identify as Christians or as children of God first and foremost before we identify with any nationality or any race or anything else. Father, please help us to be those people. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. May God bless you all.